and welcome to another podcast from Odell Technology. Today, we're fortunate enough to be joined by Amira Patel, CEO of Vital Sense. Hello, Amira. Hello. Good to meet nice you. To Good to be you. here. Okay, nice to see you. Um, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind telling the audience a bit about your professional background and how you ended up being the CEO of this wonderful organization. Um, I often get asked what what I am or what my background is, and it's quite a hard one to describe, to be honest. I started out life as a medic, um, but I've always loved building things. And I think from a young age, I've built whatever I can with whatever I can find. So I've always been a bit of a closet engineer. And uh, midway through my medical degree, and now this is going back over a decade, um, I did a PhD. And it was a bit of a strange PhD for a medic to do. It was in signal engineering and applied maths. So I was a little bit of a laughing stock among medics who expected me to do something more mainstream, cancer biology or something like that. Um, but anyway, that was that was a real passion subject for me. And long story short, ha- have been passionate about healthcare technology for a long time and worked in different startups, advised various funds, found myself after practicing as a doctor for a few years, working at Microsoft Research. Um, And that's where I met TidalSense. It was still a small company, few people, prototype technology, um, but really, really interesting and really exciting. Okay, so can you tell me something about TidalSense and what it does and who who they are? Um, Yeah, so TidalSense has been going for 10 years, which might seem like a long time, but it's a technology company that has built a new sensor technology that can detect changes in lung function, lung physiology very sensitively. And so... Effectively, what the what the company does and has done is built very rapid point of care AI based diagnostic tests off the back of the sensor technology. So fundamentally, the mission of the company is to completely change the lives of people with respiratory diseases. Respiratory diseases are completely, I think, under resourced, underappreciated, um, extremely prevalent, and this huge care gap. So that's really where we sit. But that's uh, why is there a need for a new technology in a respiratory diagnosis? Now, unfortunately, I have to go back to the 1800s to talk about respiratory diagnosis because, as with a lot of things in medicine, diagnostics and current clinical practice has sort of evolved over time. And if you look back at the evidence for why certain methods and techniques are in practice as diagnostics or as clinical standard for care, you won't really find anything. So the current diagnostic test for conditions like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and asthma, which together account for more than 10% of Earth's population, um, goes back to the 1800s. So the diagnostic test is something called spirometry. It's a it's a big bit of equipment, forced breathing, very low specificity, it can, not very good at differentiating conditions. And it's not changed significantly in its you know in its function since the 18 1800s and it only became popularized in the 1900s okay that's interesting i wasn't aware of that but tell me what effect has ai had on your your thinking and your business your business now and what fears and i suppose what aspirations do you have for ai um that's a complex question so i mean what we've what we do with ai is we have a novel sensor signal um, and we're able to pick up very accurately what's going on in someone's lungs. So we have a, a physiology-based signal that we're detecting with the sensor. And what we're using machine learning to do is to automate the diagnosis. Normally, the diagnostic test for COPD and asthma spews out a bunch of numbers, and that then has to go off to a clinician to interpret and make the diagnosis. Um, and what we've done is we've automated that process. And I think that's where a lot of you know, machine learning, AI, vision, computer vision, algorithms are having a lot of impact is in effectively allowing some of the processes that are slower and more challenging for clinicians that take a lot of time to effectively be automated. What measures are you taking to ensure that you're using AI ethically? Well, and that's a that's a multifaceted question which deserves a, probably an entire podcast on its own but there's there's different angles to ethical use um 
that if we start with the data that we use to train the algorithm, you know, we've got to make, of course, make sure that that's collected ethically. Diversity in training data is so important. And we spent many, many years collecting as much diversity in data as we could. And that's not just age or ethnicity or conditions, but also trying to make sure that we're not excluding certain socioeconomic classes, because we know that these conditions are more prevalent in people who are worse off. Um, so there's that side of things. There's also, you know, the process of actually building the AI itself. And we always use very simple, the simplest, lowest complexity algorithms that we can. And those are the ones that we implement. Um, and they tend to be the ones that are more explainable or more interpretable. I don't think I've done this question justice, but it is a much bigger yeah. question. We can always come back to it. We can always come back to it. But can you tell me about any interesting projects that you're involved in with that the title sense is involved in currently? Um, there's a lot of really interesting projects ongoing in various areas. So one of the things we're doing at the moment is evaluating the ability of our technology to do early diagnosis. And this is this is something which we know we have to push towards because if you can diagnose early, you can create huge population scale preventative healthcare um, changes. We've got a really interesting project going on at Hull, which is looking at embedding our technology on the lung cancer screening program as a way of helping to find the patients at an early stage um, and intervening there. That's just one example. There's a lot of other really, really cool stuff going on. Which partners do you work with? And on which initiative? Um, there's a lot of different stakeholders that are aligned to doing what we're trying to do, which is create a change for patients, completely change the clinical pathway. So you've got the pharmaceutical industry who were trying to develop earlier stage drugs for, for COPD and asthma, particularly COPD. If you can administer those at a sort of pre-COPD or early COPD stage, then you can change the trajectory of the disease. So there's there's a pharmaceutical industry who are very well aligned to what we're trying to do. So that's one stakeholder group. Patients, of course, are the other stakeholder group um, that are often neglected, but we've embedded patients throughout the entire design cycle of our product. We continue working with patients to make sure that the technologies are actually acceptable to patients. And then health systems, so the NHS at the moment is the other stakeholder group. And we know Respiratory diagnostics is particularly challenging for the NHS at the moment. The demand is enormous. Um, Asthma Lung UK published a report at the end of last year, which from self-reports of patients with COPD came back with the results of one in eight patients reported to have waited 10 years for a diagnostic test and one in four waited um, five years. Staggering, absolutely staggering. COP is a condition where early diagnosis means that you're going to have a better outcome. Yeah, and, and to be honest, because there haven't been early diagnostic tests available, it's very difficult to know what that will be. But we do know that smoking cessation or removing yourselves from the, the disease causing factor is one of the biggest things that you can do to change the outcome of the disease. There may also be some efficacy from early intervention with uh, with with therapeutics. Okay, so what differences do you think this will make to the NHS? as a service provider, um, which is obviously a health economics question. Yeah, and that's that's something we've been working a lot on this year because we have now got our technology to a point where it is performing very, you know, the performance of the algorithms are extremely strong. Um, respiratory diagnostics is a challenge for the NHS because it's supposed to be delivered in primary care secondary care really doesn't have capacity to do it. And that we're seeing that at the moment where we're now in a situation post pandemic, that a third of GP practices don't have access to spirometry. They're referring their patients to wherever they can for a test and the referrals are getting turfed back out. Um, and we know there's a real challenge that, you know, spirometry stops during the pandemic in a lot of centers, hasn't really picked up since then. So if we look at the value proposition head to head, spirometry versus our technology, Spirometry takes up to 30 minutes to conduct. We've got a test end to end that's under five minutes. So we can deliver it right at that first point of contact. Training requirements for spirometry are another big pain point for the NHS because you need a specialist trained certification course to actually be able to perform it. And you need a certain level of qualification in terms of your, in terms of your clinical training. 
to be able to interpret the test, huge cost drain for the NHS. And a lot of GP practices don't have access to that staff. We've taken training down to under 15 minutes, and that's something we've validated. And we've demonstrated that a healthcare assistant or a pharmacist can safely perform the test. And then if you look at the precision of spirometry in primary care for diagnosing COPD, it's really poor. I mean, there are some reports going as low as 63%, maybe slightly higher, but you know where we've taken ours is up to 90% positive predictive value, 90% negative predictive value. So it's a very clear value proposition. You've got a technology now that we've developed. You can stick on a GP's desk. As soon as that patient comes in, they can immediately get a diagnosis as long as the as long as the model's confident and of course you know the way we've deployed the algorithm is that it will tell you if it's not confident in the diagnosis and in those patients you would then refer them on for spirometry but you've cut out you know potentially 50 60 70% of the referral workload okay when do you hope to roll this technology out across the nhs uh we're looking at next year so that's uh it's quite an exciting time we are we are taking this through class two regulations at the moment um, in the in the EU, which will place the tech on the market next year. Um, and then it's and then it's go. You know, there's there's really strong market pull for this because spirometry cannot be delivered with the testing volume, the backlog of patients in primary care. There's big pushback from GPs, there's big pushback from respiratory physicians saying, what are we doing with spirometry, quite frankly, for diagnosis? This is outdated technology. We need to change the whole paradigm for how we diagnose this condition. Okay, so what are you going to do about long-term effectiveness? And how are you going to monitor your effectiveness? Are you going to have a registry? That's a, that's a, yeah, it's a good idea. We're, we're going to be doing a lot of extensive post-market research projects. And so that's never going to stop. Um, we're going to want to refine the algorithm over time. No technology works straight out of the box, right? And we're we're not expecting it to. So there will be a lot of post-market research that goes on. Okay. But what excites you about your job and what you're doing right now? Yeah, I've actually been thinking about that a lot this week because a lot of really exciting stuff started happening for us as a company. I think, I mean, I have, I have severe asthma myself. It's pretty well controlled, but this is one of the reasons I'm so passionate about the technology is that I can really understand where the care gap is for patients. Um, I can really see a path through to this having impact for patients. Of course, generating cost savings for health system, fantastic, right? We're definitely trying to do that. And we've demonstrated, you know, in our models that we can do, you can provide short-term cost savings to the NHS, but patient is at the center of this. And that's really our mission is to have impact for patients. And we're really close. So that's really the most exciting thing, I think. Okay, what challenges have you faced putting a health technology into the health services? Um, so many different ways to answer that question. Um, you, respiratory physicians by their nature are quite conservative. There was, you know, I think if you look at the evolution of respiratory technology over time, it takes a long time to embed it. It takes a long time to create the culture change with doctors, the pathway changes, the acceptance of new technology. We're still on that journey. We've got a new technology. There's there's great demand for the technology, but there's still challenges to come around getting it adopted and embedded and getting it stick. Okay, okay. When or do you wish to expand into new markets and territories outside of the UK? As soon as possible, to be honest. I mean, one of the reasons for taking the EU route to regulation is so that it opens up the entire EU market. And we know the problems exist. The same problems exist in many EU countries. Absolutely. So looking six to 12 months ahead, what do you see for the company? Um, I think the next 12 months is going to be really exciting. We're looking at, fingers crossed, getting this embedded in more and more NHS services, getting this rolled out across the country. We've already got collaboration starting in European countries. Um, so, you know, working on market access in, in those geographies. How are you funding the organization currently? So we have we have some institutional investors on board. Um, we have two big investors, BGF and Downing, that joined at the seed round. We've also been really fortunate that the government has been very generous in giving us grant money. So 
those are really the two biggest sources of, of financing for the company to date. Um, in the early days, it really was Innovate UK, SBRI, NIHR that that funded us. Okay. And tell me, do you think that the, 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 the algorithm that you're developing will end up with other diagnostic pathways? Um, that's, that's definitely where we're going with it. We have already an ASPA diagnostic that's going through the, the, the performance validation stage. So we're doing our trial starting next year. Um, that's next on the market. So after COPD, we're looking at asthma. We're looking at being able to, you know, predict smoking related damage, potentially, this is speculative now, potentially supporting smoking cessation services. You know, we have we have a bigger population healthcare plan in our minds about how we can affect change. You look at the lung cancer screening program, huge uptake from patients, you know, almost up to 50% uptake in some centers, which is pretty remarkable for a screening program. You've got a real opportunity to create health behavior change at that at that point. Okay, that's remarkable. I really enjoyed talking to you today, and I hope to be talking to you again in another six months time. I think what you've done is absolutely remarkable. I love the technology. And it is a game changer. I think spirometry has had its time, probably had its time many, many years ago. And so I think you're, you're ahead of your time, and I wish you all the very best of luck. Thanks a lot.